Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is what you guys should be doing um, after today slash tomorrow, if you're actually going to be here tomorrow. So like I said, you got if you're not here tomorrow, you've got eight days of no instruction from me. And um, I worry that that is going to be mind erasing for a few of you. So what should you do over break? Or the, over that eight day break. And I think I showed you this yesterday. Maybe I didn't get to your class. On Teams, I have posted the answers to every review packet we've done. Um, and including the one that I just handed out just now. For these review packets, we have not done every page. So for example, I know in, uh, which one? Let's, the weather review. So if you remember, this was the very first one I gave you. We did the first page. We did the second page, the third page, and the fourth page. But we didn't do the fifth page, which talks about um, like the, the windward and the leeward side of the mountain, which I know some of you struggled with in lab uh, yesterday. Um, so we didn't do this page in class. So what I would recommend you doing is doing that lab. Sorry, he did ask first. So I would recommend doing that page on your own, then coming and checking it out, the answers, and seeing how you did. If you don't know the answers or you're really struggling with something, obviously look it up. But if you need me, message me on Teams and I can help you. I have blank copies of all the reviews right here. So if you need one on your way out, you're welcome to grab one. Um, so this is one thing I would recommend doing. So they're all there, um, including, remember I gave you the need to know facts in the review notes if you happen to lose yours. I also posted that there. So here's the need to know earth science facts, just like it's like 100-ish, need to know facts. If you do nothing else, I would really recommend memorizing all or most of these. I'm sure you know a whole bunch of them already. So I would definitely make sure you know all of these. The rest of the packet there, that is just notes from each chapter. We've talked about this already. Please do not do, don't do nothing. Eight, seven or eight days of no earth science is not going to be good for your grade if you do nothing. I'm not saying you gotta spend hours every day, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes 30. every day. 30 minutes, I think honestly, you'd probably be pushing it. Maybe an hour total in that week. 30 minutes of total, 30 minutes of each time. Okay, I mean, if that's your goal, then that's your goal. Do what you gotta do. But anyway, let's look at the Earth's history, which you did yesterday. So grab that one. Well, um, you did not have to complete it, so I'm not checking it, but there's a few things that I do want to go over. So like I said, the entire packet can be checked on Teams. Uh, so if you don't get to the entire, if we don't get, we're not going to get to the entire packet. So you can check on Teams for all the answers. Why can I not find anything when I'm looking for? Perches. All right, so let's just go quickly through this. A good index fossil has lived for a short geological time, widespread geographically, and is easy to recognize. Line X, Y, well, that's an unconformity. An unconformity represents a gap in the geological record. And why? Because of weathering and erosion. It has removed entire layers of Earth's history. So we can't see them because erosion has moved them away. Uh, this layer A, it's actually impossible to tell if this was an extrusion or an intrusion. Um, the reason for that is, how, actually, let me ask you this. How do we tell the difference between an intrusion and an extrusion by looking at them? Oh, we don't know. How do we tell if it's an intrusion or an extrusion, Alex? By the lines. By the lines. Remember contact metamorphism. I always called it burn marks. You can't burn something that wasn't there. Meaning if this made it to the surface, there was nothing on top to burn. 
So I always explain to you if it's bald on top, then it's an extrusion. It means when it formed, it made it all the way to the earth's surface, cooled and hardened, and new rocks were put down on top of it after a million or so years. This one though, it's hard to tell if there were burn marks. Why can I not tell if there's burn marks on this one? Yep, but there's none on top. So that leads me to believe it's an extrusion. But how could this maybe have been an intrusion and now I can't tell? Yeah, Alex, got it again? What about the top layer? Well, no, so that's not what I'm asking. There, The way this looks, there's no burn marks. So it means it's an extrusion. But could this have been an intrusion and something made me now not sure? Let me rephrase this. This could have been an intrusion, but something about this picture makes me not sure if it's an intrusion or an extrusion. What about X, Y? It's an unconformity. There may have been whiskers here. And that whatever caused the unconformity, so whether a glacier came through or a river came through, it erased that top layer. I don't know what was going on there. So I don't know if this one's an intrusion or an extrusion, and I don't think they would give you that on the region. But just to quiz you, what about this one? Does that... Is this going to be an intrusion? C, is this an intrusion or an extrusion? No. How do I know this is an extrusion? There's no whiskers on the top. If it's bald on top, it's an extrusion. Bald is an extrusion. And the reason for that is it made it all the way to the Earth's surface, cooled and hardened, and layer B was put there after it was cooled and hardened on Earth's surface. So it's definitely something you guys have to remember. Bald on top is an extrusion. All right, just to wrap this up, um, why are fossils useful? Uh, or why are index fossils useful? Because if I know how old the fossil is, I know how old the rock is. Putting these in order, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, then seven. Questions on how to do any of that? All right. Then real quick on the next page. Number one, A. Number two, A. Three, E. Four, shale. Five, marble. Then putting them in order from oldest to youngest would have been limestone shale, extrusion followed by context metamorphism, sandstone and conglomerate. Any of those that you're not sure how I got that answer. All right, on the next page, which one is the oldest? That would be this shale. Which one is the youngest? It would be that conglomerate. What caused the unconformity? Well, that would be weathering and erosion. You didn't have to do four. Number five is contact metamorphism. Guys, are anyone checking their work? Uh, six, intrusion. Seven, sandstone. Eight, intrusion. Nine, sandstone. Ten, quartzite. Questions on any of that? If you didn't finish it, the answers are on Teams, like I just showed you. Did you guys get this far? I just want to test. Um, so I will. So we have Y, Phanerozoic, Paleozoic, Slurian, Early, something about salt gypsum being formed, and then Erie, Ontario lowlands. Do you know how to figure out that part? Where the landscape region they could have lived? So did you guys just skip that part? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about it. Did you have the rest of it though? Yeah. Okay, so the fact that it was from the Slurian is what we need to know. Yeah, right there. You got it. So knowing that they were from the Slurian, Slurian is shown on this map of the United, uh, not the United States, of New York State with the uh, vertical lines. So that Eosopher thing, could have lived anywhere where the Slurian rocks are. 
So you can see a big chunk of them right here, which is uh, basically just south of Lake Ontario. But is, does this page tell me a landscape region? This page does. So I know we were just south of Lake Ontario and that's the Erie Ontario lowlands. It's the only place we'll find the eosophers. Uh, so then the rest of them, uh, we got G, Phanerozoic, Paleozoic, Devonian, Middle, Erosion of the Acanian Mountains, and the Allegheny Plateau. And then we got C, Phanerozoic, Paleozoic, Devonian, Middle, Erosion of the Acanian Mountains, and the Allegheny Plateau. Again, if you don't have these done, I would recommend doing them and checking your work on teams like I showed you. Questions on that one? At the bottom, again, why are they useful? Because the age of a fossil equals the age of the rock. Again, number two is a repeat, easy to recognize, widespread, live for a short geological time. And something that works just like an uh, index fossil would be a volcanic ash fall. Mm -hmm. right. No, topography is the elevation of the land. So that's the connect the dots for slightly older kids showing mountains and elevation. <laughs> But on that note, I want to make sure you know how to do, because I only asked you to do one through four. Let's do page five. Why don't you grab it? And see if you can remember half-life stuff. So right now, we've got a diagram here. Remember, first thing you should always do is kind of read the picture. We've got the sample before decay. Just like I gave you a Twizzler before you ate it, you have 100% of it. What happened to that Twizzler every time you took a bite? Half of it got eaten. So just like this, half of it has turned white. What happened the next time you took a bite? Half of what was left, which was half of it, got eaten. So then we go from half of it down to a quarter of it. Now, does the decay, does the, does this thing just poof disappear? What's it turn into? Well, it does, definitely there's less of it, but it doesn't just poof disappear. If you remember the Twizzler, what did it, it turn into? Come on, poop. Here, they don't turn into poop they turn into their stable decay product. So carbon-14, notice C-14 goes to N-14. Potassium-40, so K-40, can either go to argon or calcium. Uranium-238, so U-238 U goes to PB-206. And rubidium-87, so RB-87 goes to SR-87, strontium-87. You had your hand up, Remy. Um, can you show me where I would find the answer? Well, yeah, let me first finish the questions one through three. So um, this is what they turn into. They don't just poof, disappear. They turn into something else. So this white area, if this was carbon-14 is the black, then the white is nitrogen-14. So you can see as the black gets smaller, the white grows. So in this case, if the half-life shown here is 5,700 years, how long have we gone by to get here? So you can see we had before any half-lives, after one half-life, after two half-lives. So we've been through two half-lives, each one of them taking 5,700 years. So how do we figure out how long it took to get to the end? Add them together, 11,400. So how much is left of that by the time we've gone through these two half legs? Okay, so we've got 25%. Out of these choices, which one would be used to date anything that is young and has organic material? First of all, what does organic material mean? Living things. So oh so carbon 14 is what Drake said. 
So you guys should remember from last year, hopefully, that carbon is in anything that was alive. Now, why the whole young thing? They said it has to be a young organic material. Anybody remember why? This will be on the regions, or at least it has been every other region I've graded. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5.7 times 10 to the third. How many years is that? 5,700. Is 5,700 that many years in terms of the Earth? Earth is 4 billion, 600 million. So if we kept going, another half-life and another one, we wouldn't get very far. That's 11,400. Even if we double that and we go through four half-lives, that's 22,800. That's not many years. Remember how when your Twizzler got super tiny, you guys were whining, it was too small? That happens in these too. So scientists would start whining that it was too small and they couldn't find it. After about 25,000 years, it'd be too small and they couldn't use it anymore. So carbon-14 is only good for young organic material. So then on that note, can we use carbon-14 to date a trilobite fossil? Why not? Yep. Trilobites are one of the oldest things. Even the last one before it went extinct, they went extinct 251 million years ago. 251 million, that what would be left of a carbon-14 would be impossible to measure. So we can't use carbon-14. So for something that's older, we have to use something else. What would the next best choice out of these four be? Yeah. So even though, and you can see I did it down here, even though that one has a half-life of 1 billion, 300 million, it would still have some decay gone before that 1 billion, 300 million, because it goes in that nice predictable pattern. So this one is going to be K40, or if you wanted to write out potassium 40. In the above example, if you start out, ooh, I want you guys to all do this. The only change is, it does say how much argon 40 is left. It really meant how much uh, potassium 40 is left. So they're saying you start out with a thousand grams. How much is left after two half lives? Hang on, everybody else is doing math. Yes. So normally we work with percentages. We go 100%, 50%, 25%. But if they give you an actual mass, you can just work with it the same way. So now we have a thousand grams. How many grams will you have left after one half life? 500. So you take that five, a thousand and cut it in half. After another half life, take that 500 and cut it in half. 250 grams will be left after two half lives. And now for question eight, they want to know how long that will take. No, it's not carbon-14 anymore. It's potassium-40. So how long does it take for one half-life using potassium-40? One point three times 10 to the ninth. And then another 1.3 times 10 to the ninth, which Trenton was right, that's... Um, that's 1 billion, 300 million. So how do we figure that out? We add them up, which equals 2.6 times 10 to the ninth. So 2 billion, 600 million. All right, let's use our next 20 minutes pretty wisely here. Grab that new one I asked you to pick up. Again, if you want to check, I would check out the rest of them. I would still do them. Check it out on Teams to get the full answers. 
I would like you guys to go to the wind page. I don't know what page number it is, but it's titled wind. Got it. Uh, there's a few things that I want to do on here that aren't necessarily with the questions. I first want you to tell me which one of these two pictures which one is considered a land breeze? By the way, the other one's called a sea breeze. So I'm asking you which one is a land breeze. How do I, how are winds named? Winds, that might be something you want to add to this. Winds are named by where they come from. So by the way, let's try this again. We've got picture one and picture two. Which one is a land breeze? Second one, because it's coming from the land. The other one is coming from the water, so it is called a sea breeze. Um, Winds always blow from what to what? No. Pressure wise. High to low. So you can always put a high pressure at the butts of the arrows, no matter which picture you're looking at. If it's a wind, you can always put an H at the butt. Remember, farts cause you to have high pressure in your butt. So the butts of the arrow are always high pressure. So if the high pressure is the butts, the low pressure is always at the heads of the arrows, no matter what kind of map you're looking at with winds. How do we get high pressure? What's the air doing if we have high pressure? Let's try this. How can you guys please put high pressure on your desk? What are you doing? Pushing where? Down. So, okay, so you know that. So let me ask you another question. How do we get high air pressure? What's the air doing? Going down. How does air or why would air go down? What kind of air goes down? What kind of air goes down? Cool. High pressure, yes. Cold air goes down. Cold air sinks. So this is where it's cold. This is where it's warm in this one. Which one's cold for the sea breeze? The water or the land? Which one's cold in this picture? Water, why? Because it's the high pressure. High pressure, the air sinks and goes down. So that means it's warm over here. All right, looking at the sea breeze, what time of day would we have warmer air over the land and cold air over the water? Is that daytime or nighttime? So you're at the beach? And it's at nighttime when this, the um, water is colder than the land? No. What time of day is the land warmer than the water? Daytime. Why is this, why, why does the land heat up and be warmer during the day because land has a lower specific heat. You need to be able to recreate this. You need to know that there's a sea breeze during the day. 
do I think you have to memorize it? No, I think you need to be able to do what we just walked through, which you could do when we did this back in a few months ago. Cold air sinks, that's high pressure. Warm air rises, that's low pressure. Wind always goes from high to low. This one is going to be nighttime. All right, let's try questions one through 11. I don't like which way does it travel. I would like you to think of which way do the winds bend in the Northern hemisphere and which way do they bend in the Southern hemisphere? This has a vocab word. This is called the Coriolis effect. So you can take a look at this map. Which way are the winds bending in the Northern hemisphere? They bend to the right. Remember when I taught you this, I said, we live in the Northern hemisphere. Of course we're right. The Northern hemisphere bend to the right. Now I know it looks like, yeah, that one's bending to the right, but it looks like, for example, this one's bending to the left. But remember, you have to put yourself on that arrow. So you, just like this one, I would go from the butt to the head. I have to turn this one upside down to see going from the butt to the head is going over to my right hand. So if they bend to the right in the Northern hemisphere because we're right, where do they bend in the Southern hemisphere? They go to the left. Now, when it says the winds converge, um, what does that mean? Converge, come together. What does it mean if they diverge? Spread apart. Uh, we already said which one was a land breeze. That's the one on the all the way to the right. We already did that one. It's the one over here. And the middle one is the one showing the sea breeze. Oh, I'm sorry. What time of day? I skipped that one. That one would be nighttime. Already did that. The middle is the sea breeze, and we already discussed that that would be the daytime. Why do we have winds? It's caused by differences in what? Mm, kind of, but really it's not the temperature, it's the pressure, which is caused by temperature. You're right. What are those lines of equal pressure called on a map? Their ISO, ISO lines is general, but when we're specifically talking about equal pressure, it's, nope, bars. Bars for barometric or barometric pressure, that's where that comes from. Or millibars, any of those are how you know it's coming, or their, their pressure lines are called isobars. And if we had a map showing those isobars, where would the strongest wind be? No, so just if we have ISO bars on a map. So we're looking at an ISO, all the lines. How do we tell where the wind is the strongest? Lines are when uh, ISO bars are close together. All right, we do not have long, so I would like you to turn to the front page of this and knock out those six questions on your own, then we'll go over them. Page one. Knock them out, and then we can be done for today.
All right. So according to this picture, what's the latitude of this guy or gal? How'd you know? Okay, so please remember that altitude of Polaris equals your latitude in the Northern Hemisphere. Speaking of, can you see Polaris in the Southern Hemisphere? Nope. What is the point directly above the viewer called? So what would right here be called? It's Zenith. By the way, is the sun ever at the zenith in the northern hemisphere in New York? Nope, just checking. Um, as your latitude increases, what happens to your altitude? Wait, before we answer that, increasing latitude, where are you going? North. I taught you one thing. Okay. If your latitude is increasing, you are headed north. Or I guess if you're in the southern here, semis. Southern Hemisphere, you're headed south. So what happens to the altitude of Polaris if you're headed north? Increases. Now, what they want to know what this relationship is called. When you increase your latitude and you increase altitude of Polaris. So when one goes up, the other goes up. Not, not, not wrong, but they are going for direct. A direct relationship, the opposite of that would be an indirect. So if when one goes up, the other goes down, that's indirect. And here's one thing. If a person travels from New York to Chicago, what happens to their altitude of players? By the way, how about if I say they head due east, due west? Let's, let's just cross this part off. Due west. By the way, what does due mean? in the due west. It means straight west. Latitude stays the same. So if we're headed exactly west and your latitude doesn't change, what happens to Polaris? Stays the same as well. Well, we have three minutes left. I guess we can be done, but you guys need to review. You have pages and pages of review that we haven't touched. Do them. Check your answers on Teams. If you don't have a computer because you turned it in, Teams is on your phone. Just Google Teams. It'll pop right up. You can log in just like you would on the re on your own computer so you can do check on teams whether you have your computer or not i extra have spare copies of everything up there if you want some more uh and that's it thank you